uh, if we're to understand uh, conscious phenomenon, personal conscious phenomenon, in a mechanistic point of view, that we'll probably be winding up understanding how local circuits make us phenomenally aware of specific skills. So here's what I mean by that. When you split a person's brain, you have the dominant left hemisphere and the right hemisphere now separated. And you say to these patients, so uh, anything new? And they say no. And yet, if they fixate a point, they don't see anything to the left of fixation. Now, why aren't they saying to me, the doctors, uh, the experimentalists, yeah, there's something very different. When I look at the at your middle of your face, or I look at your nose, I don't see left part of your face. Why wouldn't you comment on that? And, uh, and none of the patients ever comment on such a thing. And it's like consciousness for that part of the world is housed over in the right hemisphere and the left no longer has access to it and it is not part of the general conscious sphere of the dominant hemisphere. So if you think about that, what that means is that the brain mechanisms that underlie our ability to be consciously aware of the left half of space are indeed localized to the right hemisphere. And, our, and the ones for the right half of space are localized to the left hemisphere. And you then just take this further and you realize that it's, there must be a distributed system throughout the brain where these local circuits are the circuits that are enabling our, our phenomenal awareness. There's not, there's not a process by which all information goes through the conscious awareness center. If it's separated, if it's lesioned, you lose conscious awareness of it, and the rest of the brain doesn't seem to miss it. I think this uh, uh, may be good news, actually, because as you age, and you certainly are uh, losing capacity, and you're certainly losing quickness of mind, um, you're not aware of it. <laughs> Thank goodness. <laughs> All those around you are, but uh... something to look forward to. Or maybe, maybe we're there. We don't know. So, so, so after that, after Caltech, you went for a notably short postdoc in Pisa. <laughs> How many months did it last? It was short. Uh, I discovered that. Uh, that uh, neurophysiology was, was uh, far too demanding and required tremendous patience. None of uh, those things characterized me. And uh, although I had a wonderful time, met wonderful people who, uh, the, my fellow postdoc was Giacomo Rezzolatti and, and uh, his brilliant work now on mirror neurons. But there was one memorable moment uh, we, uh, the, the reason to uh, have gone to Pisa was that we were going to understand the colossal code. We were going to put the electrode down into the colossum of an animal and figure out how one hemisphere talks to the other. I mean, I went back and actually a few years ago looked at the grant we wrote in 1967. And it wasn't much more complicated than what I just said. We were going to put an electrode in the colossum. And you got your money. Ah, it was a thing. Can, can we give you more in those days, you know? And uh, so anyway, the, the experiment started, and it took months, to, it took two months uh, of my three months say, to get the screen set up to learn how to anesthetize the, the animal and to get the electrodes to work. And finally, the afternoon is there, and uh, you know how these things work, where the electrode is, plied, uh, is plugged into a loudspeaker, so if you, if you get into the... Uh, the neuron, you can hear the b -b 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 firing of the neuron, and, and you, somehow we were going to immediately figure out the code from the <laughs> so to think about it. But Giacomo Rezzolatti, who was in charge of the electrode, lowers the electrode into the colossum of this encephale isolate cat, and over the loudspeakers, clears a bell came, we all live in a yellow submarine. 
picking up a radio station on the amplifier. Giacomo, without, not missing a beat, looks up and says, now that's high order information. <laughs> And that was it. <laughs> that was it. I got out, I got the hell out of town after that. <laughs> and so, did you go to Santa Barbara from there? I did. I started my career at uh, UC Santa Barbara, where I've returned. Yeah. So here's the, well, the interesting thing. Caltech, did it even have a psychology department when you were there? No. So no psychology department there. You go from there to a neurophysiology institute in Pisa, probably the place to go. Right. And then from there you go to psychology right. in Santa Barbara. Right. So how did that, I mean, what, what was the attraction there? You, I guess you weren't around psychologists very much up to that part of your career. No, it was, it, it, uh, well, it, it was psychobiology, so that, that psychology departments under their umbrella had psychobiology, of course. Uh, so, uh, uh, and psychobiology was, was uh, depending on the institution, fell to different people to manage. So you... I've spent much, many of my years at medical schools, too, within neurology and psychiatry departments. Didn't you become chairman of psychology in Santa Barbara? Is that correct? It, it was a brilliant experience. It lasted one year, and, uh, <laughs> and uh, it cured me of uh, ever wanting to do academic administration uh, until I forgot. You became I, dean in Dartmouth. Yeah, right. I forgot, and I should have been reminded of... Uh, of that enterprise, but it cured, it cured me of it because uh, it, it really is a time-consuming uh, task, and it is a task that requires certain uh, uh, skills and patience that yeah. uh, I don't have. So, so one of your many accomplishments is um, basically being the father of uh, cognitive neuroscience. Hmm. Not that many years ago. That didn't exist. And I can remember a dinner we had, I don't even remember this, I think it was Aspen, where you were putting forth this idea of maybe having a society of cognitive neuroscience. Mm -hmm. You remember that? Mm -hmm. John Koss was there mm -hmm. and Barry. And, mm -hmm. and then years later, that society came to be and, and, and been very successful. Mm -hmm. so, so how did that all come about? I mean, I mean, f first, there was, there was no neuroscience. And then neuroscience came in, I guess, the early 70s. Right. And there was cognitive psychology, right. and then, then the two got put together to a large degree through your efforts. I mean, how did that, how did that work? I mean, where did you get that inspiration and, and the perspiration to make it work? People don't like new fields. Yeah. Well, you know, it's funny. It was an interesting time. I had moved to, uh, by that time I was at Cornell Medical School, and um, was the, the excitement and pace of being in a neurology department and always going on rounds and always seeing patients with bizarre disorders and, uh, is very invigorating uh, if, if, you're in, if, if you're in the business of neuropsychology, as it was called in those days. And right across the street from Cornell was Rockefeller University and George Miller, who I came to know. And pretty soon we were uh, having uh, drinks every night at the Rockefeller Bar and uh, uh, talking about this and that. And, uh, and the, overall, the, the intellectual part of it was that the feeling was that neuroscience was sort of light on theory about uh, how brain enabled mind, and cognitive science was light on con biologic constraints, so, but but heavy on theory. And shouldn't these get together? So one thing led to another. Uh, I remember one one time we had a testing van, a roaming testing van that went around to see our patients, and uh, a very uh, dense amnesic had come into to our lab to study. And we had gone out to his house to test him uh, out on Long Island, and I brought George along. And uh, he was, uh, he had never really seen a clinical case of, uh, of, uh, of amnesia, and subsequently he saw cases of many things. And he made the, the wonderful point, he says, you know, experimental psychologists try to break the brain by reaction time and increasing uh, errors made and so forth and analyze how the system works by seeing it work at its edges. And in neuropsychology, that just pours out of uh, the patient uh, bizarre behaviors that are there for analysis. And so we continue to talk about it. And, and uh, one night, uh, as the story goes, uh, we came up with the term uh, cognitive neuroscience. And 
uh, we we just went from there, and he he was instrumental in the Sloan Foundation uh, funding our initial institute, which is the Cognitive Neuroscience Institute. Uh, we uh, uh, got that going, had several meetings, and then finally started the journal. And then by that time, uh, I was uh, out, of, out in Davis and had my colleague Ron Mangan coming through the system and uh, we and Bob Knight, and there was a whole wonderful group at, at Davis. And, uh, and then we started this idea of a society. And, uh, and actually, Ron and I batted it back and forth for the longest period of time. And, Ultimately, we just said, well, let's just do it. And we went down to the Fairmont Hotel and put the visa card down, and, uh, and $5,000 was, uh, you know, charged against the card, but we had our room, and um, a few months later, the thing was organized, and 500 people, 450 people showed up for the first meeting, and the society, that society has never looked back either, so it worked out. Uh, it, it's bottom up, though. It's, uh, it was there by that time. The, the field was, the brain imaging was just coming on. The event-related potential people had really developed the techniques to have another form of brain imaging. Uh, uh, interest in clinical patients was high. Uh, it, it just happened. It, it, was it smooth sailing? It seems like, you know, boom. Just went from one thing to another. People, it wasn't any resentment from sort of traditional neuroscience people about this thing being launched? Well, no, I, you know, there was in the uh, discussions prior to the meeting uh, of actually just doing it, there were all kinds of wise emails sent around while, while you shouldn't do it. Yeah. You know, uh, we don't have to do another meeting, yada, yada, yada. Uh, but uh, uh, f finally, it just sort of, uh, uh, and in large part due to Ron, who's here tonight, uh, just kept after it. He just said, you know, this. this I think this is right, Mike. I think we should do it. Yeah. And uh, so uh, we did it. So, it was a good thing. so now in, in, in recent years, you've been plugging more about the mind studies, mind as opposed to maybe a conjunction with cognitive neuroscience. Is there a difference between those studies in the mind institutes or centers for mind? We have one, you mentioned Ron sitting right up there. Yeah. We have one in Davis that you, uh, you got the ball rolling on that. And, and so, so, so what's the mind, mind stuff all about? Seems, seems retro. Seems like we're going back to William James, right? <laughs> yeah. I, I, uh, the goal w with um, the Mind Center, uh, the, one, the one I'm starting, the Sage Center for the Study of Mind at Santa Barbara, is, is really inter widely interdisciplinary. Uh, I want uh, in, at the same table uh, economists, philosophers, uh, psychologists, neuroscientists, evolutionists, uh, maybe even uh, computer scientists, and and, and humanists too uh, uh, are are showing tremendous interest in this. And the notion is that you could take almost uh, any concept or word you could think of and have people think about it from their perspective. So you could take the word, you could, you could run a, a, a year-long seminar on just the concept of pain, or uh, on uh, moral reasoning, or on uh, color, uh, whatever it is. And every, every one of those fields has something to say about it. Uh, and it, it it would seem to me to ultimately enlighten and, and deepen uh, each person's understanding of that concept. Uh, Ed Pellegrino, who, who is now the head of uh, this bioethics committee I'm on, and when he was dean at uh, the medical school, I think he was dean at Yale, uh, tells the story that when the medical students arrived, instead of beginning to teach anatomy and physiology right off the back, he gave them a stack of novels to read. And, he's, and they're all about human suffering. And he says, you go read these novels, told the class, you go read these novels, I don't want to see you until you've all read these novels, because you're basically 21-year-old kids and none of you have ever suffered. And because you're going to see a lot of suffering, that's what your profession is going to be dealing with, I want you to know about it before you start learning the, the, the facts of medicine. 
And that sort of insight, I think, uh, uh, can, can really uh, be broadly uh, uh, used on all of these concepts. In the, in the area of uh, moral reasoning, the new brain imaging work that's coming out from several labs now, Princeton and Harvard, and uh, my colleague uh, Scott Grafton and his philosopher colleague Walter Center and Armstrong are all beginning to see that you can study such things as moral reasoning from a neurobiologic dimension now. Now that's, and, 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 the, and the moral philosophers, of course, which have thought about this problem for a long time, so deepened the neuroscientific uh, uh, conceptual use of that term that it is a, it is a very tonic and buoyant experience to see that those interactions occur. So the hope is that uh, uh, those ideas will, will come together in a, in a strong and robust way and, and uh, we'll really have something of interest. So you mentioned uh, the President's Council of Bioethics. You've been on that for a number of years now. Okay. And uh, you're in the minority there taking a strong pro-stem cell research approach, embryonic stem cells. Yeah. And of course that's contrary to the I guess the dominant view on that, on that ethics committee and contrary to the administration viewpoint. You've been uh, very outspoken about your position, uh, your book, Neuroethics, uh, op piece page, wonderful op piece page in New York Times. Well, what kind of reactions have you gotten to that from, uh, from scientists, from lay people, from people, you know, writing in? It's a, uh, you know, this is, uh, it's interesting, this concept of outspoken. I don't feel outspoken. I just feel spoken. In other words, you, you look at a body of information and you see how, how you think about it. And you just, you're there to offer your opinion on, on it. Uh, and uh, I do. But because of the, the, larger, the larger context of this particular meeting where there are a lot of people who are against it, Somehow you, it becomes outspoken. No, it was inspoken. It was <laughs> it was just spoken. So I think that's an interesting point of view. But to get to your point, uh, uh, there's it's a fascinating response you have uh, from the, the public at large. Uh, out of all the publicity this has has received in response to the op-ed piece and what have you. Uh, you get a tremendous, uh, in the email world, a tremendous email response. And uh, now it may be just the way it works, but I have, had, I have not had one uh, negative email about the position that, that I took, uh, only positive. And, uh, uh, oh, that's not true. No, that's not true. Actually, there was one... Uh, rather negative uh, exchange, but it was from a fellow member of the council. <laughs> so, <laughs> you, know, you gotta give as good as you get, I guess. And, uh, but, but other than that, the, the response has it, been, uh, been overwhelming. But more importantly than that, you start to, you start to uh, give talks that have this neuroethic bent to them. And you travel around and you, and you see various people. And what's so interesting to me is that the, the issues raised in neuroethics, uh, uh, bioethics, uh, stem cells, uh, moral reasoning, uh, drug enhancement, all these things that uh, are out there, capture the interests of everybody. And all I tell them in my message is, Every person has to think these issues through for themselves because they, they so impact how they're going to think about themselves, how they're going to think about what the culture means, what the human condition means, and all the rest of it. No one should accept these things uh, uh, as, uh, well, so-and-so thinks that, and so therefore I'm going to think this, or I'm going to think that way because he said it was okay. No, 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 no. This, the, every one of these issues should be carefully thought through uh, and, and given a sense of uh, personal identity because uh, I can tell you that, that almost every issue that presented itself over the course of this four or five years on the council, at the beginning of it, I was never clear what I thought about it. I mean, I, I simply did not have a, 
a view of, uh, of drug enhancement or stem cell or the morality of uh, how much, mor how, how much uh, moral status you want to confer on an embryo, uh, is there an interest in universal ethics, how could we get there? Uh, these, these aren't things that you go around thinking about. Uh, but there, you should. You should start thinking about them because the science is so profoundly advanced now that uh, that they're coming up and and people should be ready for them. I mean, it's it's like uh, uh, learning to speak English, learning to speak French. Learning, it's one of going to be one of the fundamentals of a person's life. Is what do I think about all this stuff? Now? And I think each person has to go after it. For, so, for those who may not be familiar with this, tell us about this council. Um, it, it was appointed by the president? It, it, For what purpose? Well, the original purpose of the council was to inf uh, advise the president on advancing biotechnology issues. And it was appointed, uh, uh, originally appointed in the context of the stem cell uh, issue that came up in the original stem cell speech, which was in August of 2001, just, just before 9-11. And um, uh, and so, in handling the policy that uh, President Bush uh, put forth, he also formed this council. And he appointed uh, a very famous bioethicist, Leon Cass, to chair it. And, uh, and then, over a course of two or three months, uh, Cass, uh, through some process that I do not know the details of, uh, picked uh, 18 members. And I received a call one day from him asking whether uh, I wanted to serve on it. So, uh, uh, which I did, uh, and, and I don't regret it for a minute. It's been it's been a fascinating experience, and it continues uh, as we speak. So, you make recommendations to to the president. I, you know, I don't. Well, the, the most explicit project we had was to look at stem cell research and cloning and make the distinction between reproductive and biomedical cloning. And on that issue, we actually voted uh, what, what the various council members uh, felt about it. Uh, and that was then passed on, uh, that, that, that advice was passed on to uh, the White House. Uh, on most of the other projects, they are, it's just a full and open public discussion of various issues that result in some kind of publication, and there's no vote associated with them particularly. There can be, a, in a couple of them, uh, I disagreed with the tone of, of, of a few of them, so we were able to write dissenting statements uh, in the back. So it wasn't a vote, it was just a, a collection. Of, there was the main piece, and then there was the, the, the uh, uh, subsequent uh, personal opinions that were attached to the uh, Report about what people thought about whatever it was that we were talking about, but uh, it it is a uh, uh, it's a uh, very interesting uh, process. This last meeting, for example, um, tr is, is trying to break new ground and looking at uh, organ transplantation. And the problem there's a crisis in medicine that 52,000 people died last year because they couldn't get a kidney. And so the, it's a growing, such a growing problem. It's not being diminished in any way. And so uh, the um, council, the new chair, Ed Pellegrino, brought in uh, some very diverse uh, uh, opinions on how to solve this problem, uh, including uh, one famous bioethicist, uh, Bob Vetch, who cha has changed his mind, is now wanting to explore maybe the possibility that uh, we have a marketplace, free market for organs. People can sell organs if necessary. That's always been frowned against in the United States because there's a coercion factor to it that poor people might do this more than uh, well-to-do. And, and, uh, but there's such a dramatic loss of life now that uh, this idea is cropping up. Another idea was presented uh, that is used in Holland is a, basically a form of constrict, conscription, which is that when you die, the state owns your body, not you. And if the state can see that they can use these organs for save lives, they will 
they would sort of do so. These are not, these are not ideas that uh, Americans are used to at all. Uh, and it's a, it's a, so any kind of change will cause a sea change in, in uh, how to think about it. And then there was a very vigorous uh, uh, presentation of, of the market theory from um, a man by the name of Richard Epstein out of the University of Chicago and a very a vigorous defense of the current method of UNOS uh, way of getting organs from the head of transplantation surgery at Harvard. The point being that uh, it's a fascinating transcript to read. Uh, within three days of each meeting, the transcript's up on the web of the, of the committee. And uh, the point is that uh, you, you can't walk five feet in modern culture without, how to, without having these critical questions pop up. And, and we all have to think about them. What we th and I, I, I don't know what I think about transplantation surgery. It, just, it was just presented uh, a few weeks ago. But it's an example of something that you start to you have to work through, and you know, yeah. two or three months, we'll have an opinion. <laughs> yeah. So there are lots of graduate students and um, postdocs and even high school students in the audience. Let's shift gears a little bit in the time we have left. So you have a, a son in brown, a daughter in Dartmouth. As far as I know, neither one of them are going into business after the old man's footsteps. Maybe that's changed. But if they were going to go into this, business, cognitive neuroscience, cognitive psychology, what have you, would you be encouraging or, 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 or would you just let them make their own decisions? What would your feelings be, given what you know about the business now? Yeah. Oh, I'd always be encouraging. Uh, there's uh, uh, Leon Festinger, my dear friend for many years, used to say, uh, I can't, I gotta clean this up a little bit. Um, uh, there's a lot of stuff at the top, but you can't keep a good person down. So, uh, uh, wh whatever the situation, if you see someone of talent who wants to go into a, a field like this, uh, uh, there's, always, there's always room, there's always resource, there's, certainly need, there's certainly fascinating topics uh, to, to address. So I would be utterly supportive. Uh, you mentioned my son and daughter. My, my son is, is just forming, beginning to form some ideas, and he is thinking about uh, neuroeconomics, actually. The next field. The next field. And uh, my daughter wants to be a geneticist, so uh, but you know, every parent in this room knows that all you do with children is get out of their way, and, and if you try to encourage one uh, idea, you will be damn sure that the next one will be the one chosen. <laughs> so, so you just lay low and let life unfold. Uh, so the the uh, but I, I, to 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 not be absolutely captivated by these topics. Uh, uh, is bewildering, and, and all the fears we have of funding and resources and all those things. Uh, I, I want to tell you, uh, there isn't a job that you can go in where the, the equivalent isn't true. Are you going to keep yours? Is your stupid boss going to fire you? The, what if the company closes down? What, you know, there, sure. We, we, maybe, in, maybe in academic life, uh, we, we, we feel uh, we're too comfortable. We, we realize that uh, we just want everything guaranteed. We don't want to have to think about the realities of the world. Well, I'm not sure that's a good idea. Yeah. So, um, so yes, go after it, absolutely. So you train lots and lots of people at postdoc level, graduate student level. So what kind of advice would you give to somebody now? Just somebody, you know, somebody showing up, you probably have this happening at Santa Barbara, you had it happen in Davis. You know, saying, okay, I want to go into this thing, and uh, they, you take them into the lab. You decide to take them into your lab. What do you tell them in terms of, you know, they want to, they want to, they want to be a, they're, they're a Mike Kazanaga wannabe? Well, I actually have an answer to that. Um, for some reason, this past year, I've been uh, ruminating on the fact that all we think about all day long are social process. You know, when is the 
last time you thought about a triangle. And yet one of the great challenges in cognitive neuroscience is to, you know, how do you see pattern, right? What we think about are things that have to do with other people's intentions, social comparison, our kin. Our mind is full of social thought. The experiment, uh, uh, we, we, there's a couple ways of thinking about it, little flips of phrase. Uh, if you were the only person in the world, probably every thought you've had in the last 48 hours is irrelevant. Uh, we, we are, we, the, the, the issue to understand in the, for the human condition is to understand all of our social states and, and how those work. And maybe that is the challenge that should really, uh, I think the young scientists should go after. I mean, one could say the cognitive neuroscience had, had this pr problems and they still have them. None of these things are ever solved in any great way. Uh, but we had uh, we had our time on attention and memory and perception and and all the rest of it and uh, and we discovered tremendous things and still discovering tremendous things. But the understanding the neurobiologic dimensions of social behavior seems to me the the uh, new field that is uh, certainly captivating my attention and my interest. So we've got about five minutes left, and I was told by. Alan Kraut, the executive director, this segment always supposed to end with uh, the, let's see if I put these, <laughs> the interviewer asking the interviewee, that's you, a set of questions. And I'm supposed to do this, otherwise we don't get our honoraria. <laughs> so we, we get an honoraria? <laughs> <laughs> that's so new. Dep depends how you're doing these questions. I see. <laughs> All right. So here, here they are. And I, I copied them out of the email he sent me. One, we have five of them. What's your favorite part of being a scientist? This is serious stuff now. And then we'll end after these five questions. You promise? <laughs> uh, uh, that you, you try to increase the number of decisions you make based on empirical findings that you, you actually try to push, push an idea ahead because of some fact that was discovered about the nature of the world. That's just really great. And uh, we, we, we do it too infrequently and to try to be can actually constrained by, by a truth of the natural world and our decision making is a, is a great thing to achieve, try to achieve. What's your la least favorite part of being a scientist? Uh, what well, we have to distinguish between science and scientists, and we all have our least favorite scientists who promote um, positions or findings that go way beyond what's in the data. And to see that sort of uh, person uh, be successful is annoying. <laughs> That's putting it mildly. <laughs> Third question. Which of your discoveries do you love the most? <laughs> what he says it. Yeah. My wife. <laughs> Scientifically. Scientifically. Oh, oh, oh. Oh. Um, uh, let's see. Um, well, I, I, I suppose that I'm pretty attached to this concept of the interpreter. It's, uh, it's so amazing when we discovered it. Uh, Joseph Ledoux, my student, and I discovered it in a, in a cold trailer in Vermont on one of our patients when we finally figured out uh, how to do the test. and. Uh, and the implications of it for the maybe human uniqueness and the, and the, and how we tie our our own personhood into culture, I think, are, are vast and enormous. And uh, I think about it all the time. Four. This one's easy. What has been the most rewarding aspect of your life outside of your science? Ruining. What has been the most rewarding? Rewarding. 
Oh, that's easy. My six kids. They're a kick. And I know that because you always talk about them. Final question. This one was not my idea. <laughs> if heaven exists, what would God say when you arrive at the pearly gates? About Mike Kazanigan. Take your time now, Mike. <clears throat> uh, that I would... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> That's God laughing? Uh, yeah, well, that would certainly be true. Um, what would God, what was the question again? <laughs> if God exists, what would God say when you arrive at the pearly gates? Keep going. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we'll end there. Thank you very much. <laughs>